Amen, amen. Okay, so I was thinking last week, a lot of folks came to church. And I don't just mean Grace Fellowship. I mean everywhere. A lot of people came to church. And some people had an experience coming to church, and in some cases coming back to church, that was so healthy and it was so life-giving to them that I'll hear testimonies like this from people. Man, I forgot how good it was. Man, I forgot how good it was to be in the room, Pastor. And, And can I just say this? I think there's something that inside of us that absolutely lights up when we sit under the words of Jesus Christ. Amen? There was a moment where Peter was talking to Jesus, and and, and Jesus said, Peter, do you want to leave also? And Peter responded back to him in this voice of desperation and said, Jesus, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You've got the words that nobody else has. And so when we come to church, that's what we're after. We're after the words of Jesus because they are life-giving to us. And so maybe you came back last week, or maybe... You've been online a whole lot, and I'm going to say some things here, and I'm going to try and be super, super careful, but can you sense the tension in the room? Are you online when you're watching online because of health? If it's for a health reason, stay there. But is it habit? Has it become habit? Because if it's become habit, Maybe reconsider. Maybe reconsider. Online is, is, is wonderful, but there's some things that we miss out on when we're online. Some of you guys, maybe you're starting to come back a bit, but you're not as deep back as what you used to be. Still talking about uncomfortable things, amen? I'm just kind of laying it out there because here's why. I think we're going to have some practical things and some graceful things that we can talk about with all of this today. I think some people are in a place where they're just broken because the last few years has been hard on us, right? It's just been tough. It's been tough for a whole lot of different reasons, and we're all different from each other. We all have our own story, and it's been tough on us, and we're not in some ways in the same spot where we were a few years ago. I, I talked to one lady, and, and she's struggling to come back to church because she has to work every single Sunday. But she's still experiencing this personal spiritual revival in her life. And she said, I'd love to get baptized, but I don't think I can because I have to work every single Sunday. And so do you know what we did three weeks ago? We did this right here. We filled up the baptismal tank, and her friends and family all showed up and took pictures. And she got baptized right there on a Wednesday. Because I don't think God cares about the day. Amen? Amen? I don't think God cares. I think God cares about the health that's in our hearts. And I think he wants us to be in a good place. And some of us are just broken. Some of us have experienced crisis in our marriage, crisis in our job. Some of you guys moved PCS during COVID. Some of us have just got things that maybe make us feel like maybe we're not supposed to be here. Maybe we're on the outside. Some of us are barely holding on to our spiritual life. Do you ever feel like you're barely holding on to your spiritual life? And you're here, and it was a win for you today that you're here. Praise God for you. I love that. Wherever we are, I just want to talk practical today about how we can be even more healthy. How we can be even more healthy. And I want to talk about it this way because some of us, whenever we talk about stuff like this, we instantly go back and we, we replay the old tapes of the religious people who used to give us a hard time when we didn't come to church enough, amen? Let's not go there. Let's not do that thing. Here's why. Because there's a scripture about Jesus Christ where it was prophesied about him that there would be a unique feature to his personality. Do you know what it is? It says, a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. And what it imagines, what that prophecy imagines about Jesus is that if you're like a long spindle of grass in the Oklahoma wind and you've already bent over, Jesus isn't going to come and mow you down. That's not his way. When we're bruised, 
Jesus doesn't come and give us the guilt trip. When we're bruised and broken, Jesus doesn't come and break us the rest of the way because he loves us and he's got a word of grace for us and he wants us to be healthy. Amen? Amen. He wants us to be healthy. So why are we here? Why are we here? We're here, you're here today, you're online today because this is where you come and you get the, the words of Jesus and those words change you we got to focus in on, on what's going on inside of our hearts. It's not even just about the words of Jesus. It's that we want to be close to Jesus. There's something inside of you. There's one thing Jesus said. He said, my sheep hear my voice. And he goes on to say that my sheep, they know how to distinguish my voice from every other voice out there. And let's be real. All throughout the week, we're all listening to other voices. All throughout the week, those voices, they're speaking poison into our families, amen? But when we come here, we hear life-giving words. And we need them, and we can discern them. You have that superpower as a Christian. As a born-again Christian today, you love the words of Jesus. And you also want to be near him. And there's also something about when we come together for worship and we sing like new wine like like we were led into this morning. But it's like we come together and we worship. And you know what we're doing when we do that? We adore Jesus Christ. And there's something, again, that turns on inside of us when we find ourselves in unity with the body of believers We find ourselves adoring Jesus Christ. Why is that so powerful? Because all week long, we've been adoring the wrong things. We've been worshiping, prioritizing, giving to the wrong things, things that bring poison into our life. And then all of a sudden, we get here to church, and it's it's like stepping into eternity. You feel that? And we want it. And we want more of it. And we know that it makes us healthier. We know it makes our marriages healthier. We know it makes our relationship with our kids healthier. Your your mental health status, we know the words of Jesus changes us. You ever feel better after, after you left church? I hope you do. I hope you do. It's why we're here, because Jesus has these blessings he wants to pour out on you. And so it's important to remember why we're here. We're here because we love Jesus and we want more of him. But this is the really, 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 really blunt part. Sometimes we don't do the things in life that are the most healthy for us. Sometimes we don't enter in to the things that we know are going to make us feel so good and be such a healthier person. It's the reason why Walmart puts the treadmills on sale every single January. And we walk in, and we we get prophetic about those treadmills. You will be purchased. You'll find your way to a garage, and then dust will collect on you. And then you'll be sold on Facebook Marketplace for much less money. And they won't want to do the math in their heads. Like, we know what's coming. Why? Because it's not a want problem, is it? It's not a desire issue. We want to lose the weight. We want to be healthier. It's not a want problem. The problem is you've built a life, and that life does not have room for the treadmill in it. And I'm not talking about space. Right, I'm talking about schedules and I'm talking about priorities and you want to adopt the treadmill into the family, but there's no room at the table for the treadmill. There just isn't. The only way to fix it is to redesign your life, to be the architect that comes in and says, I've got the want already. That's never been the problem. What I got to do is I got to change some things and I got to say some no's so that I can say some yeses. Amen? I've got to do that Spiritual health is a habit. And we have to rebuild our lives a bit so that spiritual health can be a part of our life. I was talking to a guy this week, and he goes to the gym. He's one of these guys who goes to the gym. I love those guys. I'm not one of those guys, but I love those guys. You know, he goes to the gym, and he's just good at it and stuff. And I asked him the question. I'm like, if somebody came to you, and they wanted to go to the gym, but they had a history of, like, not being the healthiest when it came to going to the gym, 
Like a whole lot of good intentions, but not a lot of follow through. Okay, gym guy, what would you tell them? What would your advice be for somebody who's trying to architect a new kind of life for themselves? What would you say? And here was his advice. He gave me a list. Number one is you've got to do steps. You've got to take it slow. Don't try to do it all at one time. When you walk into the gym, what this means is you don't see the super ripped Instagram models and let it intimidate you. You walk in. You take it slow, one step at a time. Have some victories. Do what you came there to do. Step it. Number two is focus. Did you come to lose weight? Well, then do some cardio. Did you come to, to gain strength? Well, then hit the weights, right? But keep the main thing the main thing. And don't be watching what other people are doing. You go in and you do what you came for. That's number two. Number three is home. What you do in your home life is a super big deal. You might successfully make it to the gym, but what if you don't alter your diet? What if you don't have good sleep? You're going to fail. Ultimately, you got to take it home. Number four, you got to surround yourself with things that help you succeed. I talked about this before. If I buy five bags of nacho cheese Doritos, oh, I love Doritos. And if I put them in my pantry, I will not succeed. Amen? I will not. And here's the thing. So many of us, we are the result of what we surround ourselves with. We make decisions that sometimes feel like they're out of our control. And it's because that's what's surrounding us. But here's here's the shocker. We are the architect that gets to design what surrounds us. So if we decide... We make the good decision at the grocery store, we'll do better. If we decide to turn the volume up maybe just a little bit on our alarm clock at home, maybe we won't hit snooze as much. These are the decisions that we have to make. Next, you've got to party, right? Oh, you're not listening this morning. I said you've got to party, right? You have to. Like every single win, you have to party. Why? Because we like to party, Amen. We like to party, and partying makes us happy. And when you're happy, you're more successful. Now, that's, I, I, I know this sounds really, really fluffy, but you know that your kindergarten teacher gave you a shiny gold star sticker for every single time you did something good. We are not that different from kindergartners, amen? <laughs> we need tiny encouragements. And it's like, if you win A whole week at the gym, you should treat yourself. You should make a big deal out of it. It will encourage you to go further. Next, you need friends. You need somebody to miss you at the gym. You need a buddy. Have you ever seen Finding Nemo? Right? Finding Nemo is a great story. One of the great things about Finding Nemo, in my mind, is the side characters are more memorable than the main characters are. And so you got Bruce the shark, but you've also got Dude Crush the sea turtle. Anybody with dude crush on the sea turtle? Okay, so it's so funny, and he's dude is everything, right, in this whole whole scene. And all the little fish are riding on dude crush's back, and it's it's great comedy. And what he's doing is he's, he's taking them someplace in the sea near Australia, and he wants them to all leap off his back into the right stream. And so one of the things he says is he says, do you have your exit buddy? Do you have your exit buddy? And if you've ever been part of extreme sports, you know that particular question, right? Because some of these things require that you have a little partner that you're going to go and do the thing with because hopefully they've listened to the things that you were distracted for. That's the way it works, right? Do you have your exit buddy? If you're going to the gym, you need a partner. Think about all the times that you built new habits into your life that you did not fully want to build, and it was really hard to build, but man, if you had somebody else going with you, they missed you when you didn't show up to the gym, amen? And they'd help celebrate with you. You need friends, and then finally, you need to freshen things up at the gym. If you plateau, you've got to do something different, and this is for the advanced folks in the room. 
If you've been going to the gym for a, lo- for a long time, you know that our bodies always adjust. It's the way that God made them, right? So if you're doing this well, it feels like part of your reward is that it stops working. You lifted this much weight, your body adjusts to it, it's time to lift more weight. Your body adjusts to it. It's time to do something slightly different so that you keep growing. And we're going to come back to that as well. So now let's make all this stuff hyper-spiritual. When you come to church, it's about steps. Don't get intimidated by the mega-Christians. Oh, it happens. Amen? Don't get intimidated by the people who pray every single day. You just do you for now. If you're like, hey, what I can handle is I can handle coming to church about this many times a month, and that's just where I am right now, and that's a massive win for me. Amen. It's a massive win for you. Praise God for that. Be a ninja Christian. Come five minutes late and leave five minutes early. You're like, Pat, what? Pat, what? Yes. If that's what needs to happen for you because you're an introvert and you're like, listen, I came for the words of Jesus, but I just can't people today, then ninja, go ninja, for real. If you're coming from another church and you're like, hey, listen, bad things went down at that other church and I'm kind of beat up and I'm kind of here right now and I'm not sure I can handle whatever you got going on here. I just want a sermon and I want some singing and let, like, let's do this thing. Then do that. Hide in the back corner. Praise God. I love you. I want you to have from Jesus what he has for you right now. And don't get intimidated by the rest. Can I get a big amen? Amen. Amen. Next is you need focus. What are you coming to church for? Keep the main thing the main thing. And you know what the Sunday school answer is to that, right? Like you know why you should come to church. But why are you really coming to church? For some of us, it is that we know that we grew up with a moral compass and we know that we got it from the Bible. And so when God very first, for the very first time, puts a tiny little baby in our hands and we look at it, we say, I'm going back to church because I'm going to raise this baby with a moral compass like I had. And that's why some of you are here. Now, I believe there's way more for you, but start there, and that's okay. Some of you guys came because of marriage issues. Focus on it. Like, come and absolutely be here, but maybe consider going to a marriage class as well. And maybe don't get involved in all the other things that everybody else is getting involved in. Maybe just focus on what your family needs right now. And you're like, well, is that okay for me to be selfish like that? Hey, here's the thing. Read the Gospels. You know how many people came to Jesus not because they adored Jesus? How many people came to Jesus because they wanted him to fix something? Right? We've all been there. Many of us are there right now. That's a fine place to be. So start with focus. Next, your home life is a big deal. (laughs) Um. You could change the radio. You could just bring just a little bit more worship into your week. You could maybe pick two of your work commutes each week and say, I'm going to listen to an audio Bible. Just read me a couple of chapters out of God's word. Two of my commutes per week. We live in a wonderful day and age. You can download the Bible app, and almost every single English version up there in the corner has a little like icon up there. It looks like a you know, loudspeaker kind of thing, literally just click on that and it will start reading the Bible to you. Praise God. I mean, I do that in the car all the time. Absolutely do that. But how you, how you take this stuff home and keep yourself encouraged throughout the week is massive. Next, surround yourself. Surround yourself with things that encourage you to have a healthy spiritual life. Linda and I used to do devotions around Christmas, 30 days around Christmas. And one of the things that we did during those devotions, the most successful family devotions of our lives, by the way, we would put a little piece of candy in the kids' stockings 
And after we read the scripture for the night, they got to run and get the little piece of candy out of their stockings. Do you see why it was so successful? Because if mom and dad got too busy or we started to forget around Christmas time that we were supposed to do these special candle devotions that we did, our kids made us do it. Make your kids make you be spiritually healthy. Like, maybe something simple like, you know what? Listen, guys, every single time our family gets to church, we're all going to go out to lunch at your favorite place afterward. Maybe you make the favorite place McDonald's so it's nice and cheap. But there's ice cream. Guess what? Your kids won't let you not. And that's powerful. You're like, am I using my kids? Praise God, yes, you are. <laughs> right? Like, like all these little practical things. We are, we're the architect of how we set up our lives, are we not? There may be some things that you have to say no to in your life so that there's room for God to be there and room for you to be a healthy person. Some of you guys may need to, to set a reminder on a Saturday night. A reminder on a Saturday night that fires at like, maybe it's 7.30 p.m. And here's what it says. Have the conversation about who's driving who to church tomorrow. That's all it says. Here's why. If you have a conversation on Saturday night, about who's driving who to church, and you have a, a driving plan for the next morning, what are the chances you're going to not go to church? You're going. Because you've just decided it. A lot of times, we wake up on Sunday morning, and we decide if we're going today. Make the decision Saturday night, when you're nice and alert, and before you realize you had insomnia the night before. Amen? Proverbs 27, 12, the prudent see danger and they take refuge, but the simple keep going and they pay the penalty. This is the life verse of every planner in the room. When you see danger that's ahead, you make a plan to avoid it. Amen? It is wise to make a plan. Next, you got a party. Gosh, Christians, we got a party. For real. Like there's... There's this weird theology that we get into our heads in Sunday school that says, you know, we should just be doing everything perfectly for Jesus all the time anyway. And so whenever we do something good, we can't really encourage ourselves. Oh, don't listen to that voice. Like We got, what, five or six weeks between now and high school graduations? If your family, like you, go, you know you. If our family can make three of them or we can make four of them, you know what? We're going to celebrate. Encourage yourselves. Gold star. Praise God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Next, you need friends. You need an exit, buddy. You need somebody at church who misses you. And of all the things, as, as much as I love online church, and I, I love online church, so thankful for it. The risk with online church is nobody misses you when you're not there. And I want people to miss you. Some of you guys had that experience of growing up at that little like 40-person tiny church where everybody knew each other, right? And everybody was over 90, right? Like we went to that church and, and here's what we miss about it. We miss the fact that everybody knew each other. Everybody knew each other. Everybody was super plugged in. And man, if you skipped two Sundays in a row, you were going to hear about it, right? Like they were coming after you. And it's like there, there was something beautiful in that. Now the guilt was no good, right? Like sometimes it went too far and you don't want to repeat that. Let's not repeat that. So I'm not saying guilt trip each other. Please, please, please don't. But we're so high grace in this church environment and in our culture that we will not miss each other unless invited to. Let you think on that for a second. You have to invite someone else and say, you know what? Would you miss me, please? If I'm not doing what's healthy for my life, would you miss me, please? You have to invite them in. Why? Because if you don't, they don't want to guilt you. They may have noticed but they're not going to make a big deal out of it because they don't want to guilt you. They don't want to hurt you. They want you to do well. 
We have to, in our lives, in this culture, we have to invite people to miss us. And we need that, amen? Proverbs 27, verse five says, better is open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Perfume and incense bring joy to the heart, and the pleasantness of a friend springs from their Facebook likes. I gotcha. No, from their heartfelt advice. What's it describing here? The book of Proverbs And man, read Proverbs. There's so much in there about friendship, about what real friendship looks like and how much we desperately need it. But look at what it's showing here. Is it saying this is not the kind of relationship where we're surfacy with each other? No, we tell the truth to each other. We give advice to each other that's real and helps each other. And you can only do that if you know each other deeply because you also need to know when not to to do it, amen? Because some of you truth tellers in the room, you tell a little bit too much truth and don't think enough about when the right time and the right way is. But in a deep friendship, you learn that discernment with someone else, and we've got to do this in the right way. Amen? Ecclesiastes 4.9 says, two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person fails... If one person falls, sorry, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. I love this passage because it says, you should be doing life with other people. Are you doing life with other people? Because notice it says, someone who falls alone. We all fall, do we not? 100% of this room, we all fall. The question is whether we fall alone Or do we have somebody there ready to lift us up? That's the impact of a friend in your life. And then finally, we've got fresh. If you plateau, it's time to add. So this is for you folks that you've brought the, the, the spiritual health into your life, but maybe you've plateaued spiritually. That's an interesting question. Do you remember the time when you were like growing in Jesus and you were growing so much and your joy was so contagious that people were commenting to you about it, I see so much change in you. Do you remember that? How long ago was it? Because we all have it. The thing is, maybe you reached a spot where you needed more. And that was the moment where God wanted you to take a new step into a new thing so that you would keep growing. Amen. We're too quiet in this room. Amen. I've got some real practical ideas for you on this. If you've never been in a life group, but you've got church down, maybe go to a life group. If you've got church down, maybe it's time for you to get on a serving team. Again, you ninjas in the room, I'm not saying for you yet. You let God guide the timing on that. Take your time. I'm not in a rush for you. But if you haven't grown in a while, maybe it's time for a little bit more. Because when you're at a life group, you start to share your life and you actually start studying the Bible with other people and finding out how it applies to you deeply. You start praying for each other and getting to know each other deeply. You lean on each other deeply. On a serving team, it's very, very similar. People miss you. I've got two real practical um, possibilities for you in this area Um, They actually got talked about in the announcement video, but I'm just going to go after them again. Growth Track on May 15th. We're starting that in two weeks, and that is like this four-week course for you to figure figure out how to be deeper into the church, part of the family. It's like you raising your hand and saying, I'm here, pastor. Let's go. And that might be a massive step for you. Consider it. Pray about it. Next, the men's cookout. We've got a brand new men's ministry that is starting up. If that is at all interest to any of you guys, consider this cookout that's coming up May 21st. They are launching the ministry for the first time. So there are no clicks established there. Amen? It's all, it's all brand new. And you can get in on the ground floor of that if that's at all interest to you. So, okay, Bible story. All that practical stuff. I want to show you a story in the scripture where this is exemplified beautifully. It's David and Jonathan. 
Some of you guys might already know this story from Sunday school. But let me tell you some backstory about David real quick, and then we're going to go to 1 Samuel 23. Okay, so David, young David, he's anointed by God king. He's promised that he's going to be king, but he's not king yet. And if you know the story, he spends well over a decade being not king. And David goes and he slays Goliath. You remember that moment? And everybody's absolutely pumped and celebrating that he just killed this giant in the name of Yahweh. Guess who's not thrilled? King Saul. Because in those days, if your, if your Instagram followers were more than the king, you could usurp the king. You know what I'm saying? It was scary. So Saul starts to get jealous and he starts to feel threatened and his anxiety goes up and he wants to kill David. And David has to run from Saul. David actually, according to the scripture, spends years in exile on the run from King Saul. And David amasses the following 600 men, but he still feels alone and he still, still questions God's promise to him. And you're like, 600 men, how could you feel alone? You ever feel alone in a crowd? We've all had that. So 1 Samuel 23, 13. So David and his men, about 600 of them now, they left Keilah and they began roaming the countryside. Word soon reached King Saul that David had escaped, so he didn't go to Keilah after all. David now stayed in the strongholds of the wilderness and in the hill country of Ziph, and Saul hunted him day after day, but God didn't let Saul find him. It's, it's interesting. David is under the blessing of God, under the protection of God, but David is still in a bad place. And while he's in that bad place, look what happens. Verse 16, Jonathan went to find David and encouraged him to stay strong in his faith in God. Jonathan pep talks his friend. Don't be afraid, Jonathan reassured him. My father will never find you. You are going to be the king of Israel one day and I will be next to you as my father Saul is well aware. So the two of them, this is David and Jonathan, the two of them renewed their solemn pact before the Lord and then Jonathan returned home while David stayed at Horish. David is spiritually derailed. Some of us have been spiritually disrailed, derailed, and we need a friend. Some of you in the room need to be the Jonathan to the Davids here. Some of you need a challenge to go to them. Look at what Jonathan did. Let's break this down. He went to him in person. He did not private message him. I'll take a better amen on that one. We got to go face to face. Our presence matters. Go to people when they're in this place. Jonathan also built up his faith. He didn't just pep talk him. He pointed him toward faith in God, which is the real anchor for our souls, amen? He spoke against fear and said, David, you got to remember God's promises are true. Don't give in to this fear. He spoke against fear. He said, you have a future, David. Let me remind you that God himself is the one who said you will be king. Let me just remind you, David, that that's true. And then finally he says, I'll be right by your side. Beautiful. Don't be afraid. This is all going to work out. And I'm not going to leave you. Do you see what kind of a friend Jonathan is today? Some of us need a Jonathan, and some of us need to be somebody else's Jonathan. What's God speaking to you this morning? Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Like God designed it right into us from the ground up. It's in our DNA that when we come in contact with healthy people, they grow us up. Have you seen this in your life? We need other people to grow us up. Like, we've been talking this whole time about we need to be spiritually healthy. You need an exit buddy, right? So we need to be this for each other. And now I want to speak to the team leaders in this church, to any of the spiritual leaders in this church, to the moms and dads and the life group leaders and the volunteer team leaders. Can I speak to you for a second? Your little communities inside of Grace should be hubs of spiritual health. How can you do that? People are coming to you during the week 
And there may be meeting in your living room. Praise God for that. But you know what? Make a decision to all sit together in church every single week. This is, where, this is when we're going to go to service. You know, command an entire row here. We'll give it to you. Have your row. Why? Because we'll be stronger if we go together. Aren't we stronger when we go together? Can't we go to a new place when we start to invite each other in? Even if you're one of our Sunday morning volunteer teams, can you go to another place where you ask each other, let's miss each other? Let's be Jonathan to each other. Let's go there and know each other. Amen? We got to do it better. Okay, so here's the thing. Now I'm about to take a right turn. Are you ready? Okay, don't miss this because I, I didn't make such a big deal out of it first service, okay? Big right turn. I start talking about beautiful God-given friendship and how that can change your life. And many of you are like, yeah, I know where this goes. Yeah, I know this doesn't work because I've tried friendship before. And I've been, I've been let down by friends. And I tried to make friends and it didn't work out. And here I am, and I'm a good, strong, mature person, but friendships don't work out for me. Can I give you this quote from Tim Keller? I love this. He says, we do not have all the friends our hearts need. Amen? Can you feel that? We do not have all the friends that our hearts need. Our friends tend to flee from us faster than we can forge them. Oh, that's real. It seems most of the time, as soon as we make a good, solid friend, they move away. And I know I'm in Lawton, Oklahoma, Fort Sill. And I know we're a military town. And I know that many of us have forged life-changing friendships with people who had to PCS. And I know some of you are here and you forge life-changing friendships with someone at your last duty station or two duty stations ago or somebody's on deployment. And here's what happens. This little lie starts to come in. Please, please stick with me. This little lie starts to come in. I made the choice to invest once, and then they left, and I'm not sure it's worth investing again. That is a lie. It is worth investing again. And it's hard. It's hard to invest in people. Why else is it hard to invest in people? It's, it's hard to make people priority, isn't it? I mean, we talked about schedules and busyness, and we're too busy to invest coffee time in friends, right? I got too much going on already. I don't know that I got time for you, bro. I mean, I like, like, that's how it feels. And I'm going to invest, 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 invest in you. And I don't know that it's actually going to go anywhere. And sometimes I can get myself talked right out of a healthy life pattern. So I just want to say to you loud and clear, this is difficult. But it's absolutely worth doing. You absolutely need it. Don't give up. Try and never stop trying. You know, another thing that goes wrong is we don't tend to be the greatest friends to other people, do we? <laughs> Sometimes we're not giving them the unconditional love that they deserve. Sometimes we don't make the time and the space for them. Sometimes we don't give them the greatest advice. We don't tell them the truth. It's too risky. We didn't have the courage that day. Sometimes we struggle to be a good friend that attracts and draws other good friends. It's hard. It's difficult. It's absolutely worth doing. Some of you guys, I'm just, I'm just saying, I, I want you to have spiritual health in your life. And I think friendship is going to be a big part of that. And you got to get back on the horse and keep trying. We got one last quote for you. This is from C.S. Lewis. And he talks about friendship in his book, The Four Loves. And I just love the way he puts this because this is the piece this is the person we haven't talked about very much and we don't think about very much when it comes to friendship. He reminds us, he says, for a Christian, there are, strictly speaking, no chances. And he means when it comes to friendship. A secret master of ceremonies has been at work. Christ, who said to his disciples, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. 
Christ can truly say to every group of Christian friends, you have not chosen one another, but I have chosen you for one another. See, the friendship is not the reward for our discrimination and good taste in finding one another out. It is the instrument by which God reveals to each the beauty of all the others. It is God who designs the friendships in your life. It is God who brings the friends to you. And it is God who will bless you if you trust him. He just does. At this feast, it is he who spread the board and it is he who has chosen the guests. It is he we may dare to hope, who sometimes does and always should preside. Let us not reckon without our host. Just let us not reckon without our host. When we start thinking about friends and we think about the failures of the past, when we think about the discouragements of the past, we do not involve God in the picture. And God is the one who wants you to be healthy. Amen? Amen. And God is the one who will bring people into your life. But in my experience, sometimes we don't have eyes to see. Open up your eyes and see who God is bringing. Amen? Why don't you guys stand? Let's pray. Lord, we want to be spiritually healthy people. We want our families to be strong. So Lord, would you help us to maybe make a few of these practical decisions that will help us get there. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't get overwhelmed. Try to do it all. But Jesus, would would you send your Holy Spirit to each one of us right now, individually and at home? Holy Spirit, would you whisper to us the things that we're supposed to take away from today? The practical things we can do Lord, we love you. And we pray, God, that you would change us. In Christ's name, amen.